All right. Happy Monday. Welcome to class. Yeah. Uh, two two questions. You only uh, one. If explicit, if something has its name defined explicitly, uh, does that imply internal name equivalence? Yes. So it uses the same name internally as we defined explicitly. So yes. if there's name equivalence, then there must be internal name equivalence. Yes. The only difference between name equivalence and internal name equivalence is um, anonymous types. My, my second question is for type unification. How there seem to be a lot of intuition in constructing the tree that we just don't have as we take a statement and we start applying the smaller trees that we went through the fundamentals to construct this. Mm -hmm. You don't have to construct the tree yourself. Okay. Never. Well, you're going to give us the parse tree. You will tree always be given the parse tree, yes. So we just have to number the nodes. You have to perform Hindley Miller type inference on given the parse tree. So you'll always be given. On the exams. Maybe not on the homeworks necessarily. But definitely not on the missions. Cool. Uh, any other questions? Okay, I have good news. Your midterms are graded. They're not totaled and entered into Blackboard yet. That will happen either today or tomorrow. Uh, I have other good news. Well, good news and bad news, uh, depending on your view of things. No class on Wednesday, no in class on Wednesday. Uh, I will be recording a lecture and posting it online so you don't, we don't miss a beat. So you'll be required to view that before class next Monday because we will start where that class leaves off. Huh? There's, no class Friday? There's a midterm on Friday, so I would definitely be here. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it depends on if you want to stay in the class or not. You know. Cool. Okay. Sweet. So, now we're going to switch gears and talk about the runtime environment. So we. Yes. You still going to have office hours on Wednesday? No, I'm out of town. I'm going to have no office hours this week, too. Also, I'll email everyone, though. To let you know, but yeah. Yes. Um. So when did the test come? Was it is it uh, Friday lunch or Tuesday? We'll see what we cover. Could be Wednesday or Friday too. That'd be tricky. Cool. All right. So. Uh, I will say it will not be, this midterm will not be cumulative, so it will be off, uh, starting from semantics. So there won't be any syntax or parsing. Just like, I mean, very similar to your practice midterm, right? That's why you have a practice midterm. Cool. All right, so the runtime environment. So we've talked about, we talked about semantics, which help us determine that these parse trees that we're creating, once we've actually parsed a grammar in a language, uh, once we've parsed a string written according to a certain grammar and verified that yes, this is indeed a string that can be produced. Sorry, I think this is the It's like somebody really short to sitting at this table. Uh, so once we have that string, we've verified yes, this string, these, so we've taken these sequence of bytes, turned it into a sequence of tokens, we verified that these sequence of tokens can't actually be generated by a given grammar, and we've mapped all those constructs into a parse tree. Then, using the semantics and type systems, we've been able to say, hey, this is actually, this is an allowable parse tree, right? It may be valid according to the syntax of the grammar, but that doesn't mean that it's semantically valid. So the type system allows us to say that, uh, or at least helps us to. Now we're gonna switch to is, how is this stuff actually implemented? What does the compiler do? So we've been talking a lot at kind of a high level about things, right? We talk about parsing, these kind of things can be applied to a lot of things. Here we're gonna get deep in the details. So this is really going to, I think is very cool, I really like this topic, because we talk about how things actually are built and how the compiler translates this program you're writing into something that will actually execute. So, we have 
when we talked about box circle diagrams and trying to understand semantics, we had locations and names. So what was the distinction between locations and names? Yeah. The names were human readable and they were always associated with the location. The names were human readable, so names were what you, the programmer, deal with. Right? Variables, usually, variable names. Right? And then what's the location? Memory, the memory. Not necessarily the address, right? But the memory. That value has to live somewhere, right? That name is associated with the value. That value has to live in some location, right? And so the question is, what we're going to study is how does the compiler actually implement locations and names to deal with things like scoping? How does it know how to automatically deallocate some memory, like stack allocated memory, when it goes out of scope? Right? And we want to ask the question of how does the compiler map names to memory locations? Right? When does this process happen? How does it actually do that? And so we're going to look into this process fairly deeply. We're going to assume static scoping from here on out in this section. Right, so all the code samples we're going to look at, assuming static scoping. Dynamic scoping is a little trickier. I mean, it's doable, but it's a little trickier to implement these kind of things. So we have different types of variables that have different types of memory allocation associated with them, right? So where can the compiler put global variables? And what do I mean when I say put? Where is it stored in memory, right? So where can the compiler put global variables? So what are some of the options? So you're writing a compiler. You see, aha, the programmer has declared some global variables. Where can you put them? In the cloud. In the cloud. What does that mean? <laughs> On a server. On a server? It's a little too vague, but we're both too vague. How do you get it from the server? We're talking about one, memory. Where else? Does, do you, the programmer, care where it's stored? Do you ever have to think about that when you're coding a program? Where is this global variable stored? What do you care about? You care about the scope so that you're referencing the same, but what do, what do you really care about when you say you care about scope? You can grab what when you need it? The global variable. The global variable. So you can get the value in that global variable when you need it. And what else can you do? Modify it. Change it. You can modify it. And then if you access it, what should you see? The most recent change, right? That's all you care about. So where could you put it? So we can put it in memory. What else? A register. A register? Why? So what would be what would be a problem with putting it in a register? It's definitely an option. What are the pros and cons? There are fixed number of registers. Yes. Each CPU architecture depends, varies on how exactly many registers they have. But fundamentally you're talking about those registers mapped to a piece of hardware. So there's a fixed number of registers. Mm -hmm. So if you were to store all of the global variables in registers, well, you'd be only limited to 16 registers, let's say, or 16 global variables, let's say. And then that now it says you can't use those global variables for anything. You can't use those 16 registers for everything. It would be fast, it would be pretty sweet. What else? Put it on a post-it note, put it on your monitor next to your password. If you could convince me that you could write an AI that could do that and store it on a post-it note and handwritten, then I'd say yes. Otherwise, you the programmer can't do it, right? Because this has to happen while the program's running. Right? This is the compiler. The compiler has to generate some code to do something. What else? So we talked about the cloud. So what? what? Database. A 
database, right? Or you could even store it on disk, right? You could, you, your program could write out your global variables to a file, and then when you want to read it, it reads it in from the file, and then when you change it, it writes out the new value to a file. What would be the pros or cons there? It would be slow, right? Disks, although SSDs are a little bit faster, right, than spinning disks, but, uh, right, these are much, much slower than memory, right? What's the benefit? Store file. You, you can multi-program without implementing threads because typically a process doesn't share its stuff mm. with other processes. So if you write it out to a file, you have to wait for the I.O. But if you have two concurrent processes both accessing that file, you might be able to develop a multi-programming application. I see. So you can have like a poor man's memory sharing. Right? So you could just have, depending on the permissions you gave that file, you could allow other processes to read and write your memory. Right? That would be pretty cool. Um, also, it could tolerate, right? The disk is permanent storage. Right? So then we could actually have, if your computer shuts off, your program could just go back to running. Right? That would be pretty cool. Okay, then when we talk about the cloud, how could you actually do that? You're just writing to a disk, like through an HTTP request. Yeah, so you could write to not your disk, but some other machine's disk, right? Let them deal with storing the value. And when you want it, you grab it. And when you want to change it, you upload a new value. And then you get that disk, right? So. The important thing to remember, the, well, there's a famous saying that the cloud is just somebody else's computer, right? So, uh, yeah, they, they still have to store it somewhere, right? You can't just throw it in the cloud and assume that magically things will happen, right? On, the, on their side, from their perspective, they're taking what you're giving and they're storing it in one of these options. Right, cool. And so this is the key idea, right? So depending on where the compiler places these things, affects these things. Right? So where, who can access global variables and who can't? And this kind of helps inform the compiler writer's decision of where to store this value, right? which location to choose. And it's for these reasons that maybe we don't want disk, well, we've talked about slowness, right? You think about writing to your own hard drive is slow. Imagine making a network request and then waiting for them to write it to their hard drive and then telling you that they successfully wrote it to your hard drive over the network, right? You're talking about crazy slow now, right? And so it's important to remember, what are important about global variables as far as access? So who can access global variables? What does everyone mean? I can access global variables? Yes, all, everything in the same file can access it. Right? The other important thing is any other files after that that you compile and link to that file can also access that variable. Right? That's another important thing. When you compile your program with the dash C option, right, you're creating an object file that now other programs don't need your source code. They can link to that and call those functions and access your global variables. So what the compiler does is it just chooses a fixed location in memory. And it says, okay, this global variable will always be stored here. And whenever they access the name foo, I'll instead say, hey, read from this memory location. And when they change and alter foo, then they'll write that value to that memory location. And so this is what it looks like. So if we step through, let's say we have a function here where we have global variables a, b, and c. We have an int main. We set A to be 10, we set B to be 100, we set C to be 10.45, we have A is equal to A plus B, and then we return zero. Right? So what we care about is the result of A here is going to be, should be 110, right? That's what we care about. So what the compiler does when it parses this just like how in project four, when you see variables being declared, you create, when you're doing your parsing, you see a variable declared, 
you create some type for that variable and you say, hey, this variable, we have a new variable x that's explicitly declared and it's of type foo or string or int. Just like that, when the compiler here sees new variable declarations, it says, what kind of variables are these? They're global variables, right? Therefore, what I'm going to do is I'm going to assign them some global fixed memory address. So kind of in pseudocode, what it says is A is going to live at memory location A, B will live at memory location B, C will live at memory location C. And it's important to remember these are fixed numbers that are not going to change throughout different executions of this program, depending on how it's compiled. I shouldn't say that. There are position independent executables now where this may not be 100% correct. And then what the compiler does is when it compiles each of these main functions, it's going to change it just slightly. And it's going to say, hey, the memory in memory, so if you think of memory as just a huge array, right? Memory at offset A, set that equal to 10. Memory at offset B, set that equal to 100. Memory C, set that equal to 10.45. And then set memory A equal to the result of memory A plus memory B. And it seems kind of very straightforward pseudocode. And you'll notice I didn't include the return. We'll get into function calls and returning functions and all that fun stuff. But for now, we just want to focus on where does the compiler choose to put these things in memory. And so what you can do is you can compile this program. And if you look on the notes of this slide in the PowerPoint, there'll be the exact instructions I use to compile this program. And on x86, so a 32-bit architecture, when I ran it, it basically said, okay, I'm going to put A at memory address 804.96.34, B at 804.96.38, C at 804.96.3C. And then this is the assembly instruction that it created. So the way to read this is uh, we're using AT&T assembly syntax, so we're moving left to right. So this is a move, the L is for long, we're moving 32-bit values. We're moving dollar sign zero XA into 804.96.34. So what's, so the dollar sign means this is a constant, so then what's this value? 10. X10, yeah, so it's moving 10 into this memory address, which is the memory address of A. Right? Remember, when we get to this point, the assembly language, we now no longer have A's or B's or C's to talk about. All we have is locations. And the next line is move hex 64 into 804.96.38. So what line does this correspond to? Yeah, B equals 100, so hex 64 is 100, I think, unless I made an error. Then we move hex 41273333 into here, the percent sign means a register, so this is register EAX. So this is one of the registers in x86. So what is this? So can we tell exactly what it's doing yet? Does this correspond directly to one of the lines here? Does, let's think about it this way. Does every one of these instructions on my C program map one to one with assembly instructions? No, does it even have to be there? So you gotta think, right? So right now there's a one-to-one -one mapping, right? Between A equals 10, there's a one-to-one -one mapping between source code C, A is equal to 10, this instruction. B equals 100 maps here. So the thing to think about is could it ever be the case that one C line maps to more than one instruction? Yeah, because does C say specifically anything that this instruction is going to take this many or this C code is going to take this many instructions? No, there's no guarantees, right? All we know is when I put a value in B, when I get it back later, I better get that same value. That's all we have, right? So 
just by looking at this one thing, we're moving a value into a register. But I said C is here at 804.96.3 C. This is not setting the value of C. But we see that the next instruction is move EAX into memory address 804.96.3 C. Yes? Is that because of the nature of the, um, of the type float? So what do you mean the nature of the type? They're like a float register or something? Like, I don't know. Technically, yes, but only when you're doing floating point operations. I think there's, I can't remember, I think there is some floating point stuff to do floating point calculations. Yeah. But here, are we calculating anything? Sort of, you're putting a number into, no, never mind, forget it. Yeah. So that the, the, the 0x41273333, that's the, that's, that's the value of uh, 10.45? In what? In hex? Let's see. Oh, it's still recording. Man, this is awesome. It's a good day. I get rid of random changes? Well, I think it's still fall, right? Okay, global variables. So here's how we test that. So we have a theory. You're mostly computer scientists? Never remember. Let's say you are. You're taking a computer science class, so yeah. Right? So we need to design an experiment. So I have my handy dandy calculator in hex mode. I can take put in A, I can calculate it here, and say that it's 10. Right? Good. So I know that this is the hex representation of the decimal 10. If I look here at 64, Take it into 10. In base 10, it's 100. Now when I put in 4127333, I think I'm missing a 3. 3, 4 3s. In base 10, that number is. Maybe you want to take a stab? Oh, I just messed up. 1 billion, uh, 93 million. 88,000, wait, no, that's, yeah, 88,051. So is that 10.45? What is it? It's a floating point representation. It's a floating, what type of floating point representation? Maybe IEEE? Yeah, so it is. So it's IEEE floating point representation. So we can't just convert this to base 10. This is for integers. We'd have to look, and you can actually see here, the cool thing about this calculator is it shows you all the bits, the ones and zeros here along this line. So certain groups of these mean things, and I'll be completely honest, I do not know IEEE floating point information off the top of my head, but this encodes that value 10.45 in 32 bits, and how can it use this 32 bits? Well, this is a 32-bit register, so yes. But why for my C program? Why could it use this? Probably compiled in 32-bit mode. I did compile it in 32-bit mode. What else? Float. What? Float. I used a float. The float says use 32 bits of precision. Right? If I used a double, that would, why well, it's called a double, it uses double the amount of precision as a float. And then the instructions would not come out like this, and they would be some different instructions here. So now to go back to the same thing, or to go back to the question, am I actually vision that I'm not? Let's check. Nope. All right. Wow. OK. So I am here. So what's the difference between these two lines and the first line? Right, so this is moving 10 into this memory address. And these two instructions are first moving this hex value into EAX, and then EAX into this value. So why? Or into this memory address. So semantically, what, is the, what are these two lines doing? Putting a value into addresses. Yeah, which is the same semantically as the first two lines, right? So why did it do this?
Different representation, it's a float, it's still 32 bits, yeah. But what if I had changed this 10 here to that 1 billion, 85 million, 55 thousand, whatever, 55, I don't know, I lost it. That would have been really cool. You guys would have been super impressed if I got that number. <laughs> right? So what if I put that there in this line? So, but it would be literal value 41273333 into that memory location. So why am I doing this stuff by putting it in the register? Float is eight bytes. Float is four bytes, it's 32 bit. Just like an integer on a 32 bit system. Yeah. Well, I don't, I'm just guessing here, but do you sure. still have that 41273333 inside of EAX for a reason? Mm. Like for that could be, right? Uh, let's see. We can actually <laughs> peek ahead and see that we don't use C afterwards, but that could be a good reason is we get this value into a register, so then we can compute on it, right? It's a good guess. Why do we have to guess? We don't know. Why don't we know? Aren't Did you guys smart? Because it's not your compiler. I like that answer. You didn't write GCC, did you? All that the compiler, remember, from the programmer's perspective, and you can't use that for everything, by the way. You can't just say, oh, I didn't write GCC, who knows? Right? <laughs> the important point here is that to the, the programmer, all we're saying is set this global value with name C as 1045. How the compiler implements that really doesn't matter to us. And the compiler may be doing tricks. I have a theory, which is that this is such a large it's a 32-bit number, so it may take up more space in the actual assembly language. So you may not be able to move a value that big into a memory address. But I don't know 100% if that's true or not. It, usually in something like MIPS, you can't do that because your instructions are fixed, right, to a certain length. Here, x86 is variable instructions. It could be that. It could also be because this is faster for whatever reason. And the compiler writers have done some tests and optimizations and said, for this specific system, this way is faster. <coughs> Short answer is, I don't know. So it's actually kind of fun to think about why, right? So you're trying to actually reverse engineer the compiler. I mean, obviously, GCC is open source, so you could look at the code. Or you can look at the output and say, huh, that's interesting here, right? It's doing something different for basically the same operation. OK, then going forward. We have moved the memory location 804.96.34 into EDX, register EDX. So what's at 96.34? A. A, so 10. So it's taking the value inside memory address 804.96.34, just 10, and moving that into EDX. It's moving the value into 804.96.38, which is B, which is 100, into EAX. So here we're overriding the EAX, so that disproves our theory earlier. But it was a cool guess without saying the, the rest of the code. Now we have a phrasing instruction, which I'll describe in a minute. Uh, load effective address. Let's see, if I remember correctly, it is take, so you have three parameters. Take the first thing. Add it to the second one times the third thing. So you can think the way I remember this, so LEA is load effective address. Usually the way you use it is you have a pointer in the first argument. So you have a pointer to some, this is how I always remember it, you have a pointer to an array. And you want to access the i element of that array. So you want to add to the current pointer however many bytes into that index. Let's say you're going to index five, but you can't just add five bytes because each element of your array may be, a, you know, they, they may not be one byte exactly, which is this argument. So if it's an array of integers with all four, you would have your pointer as the first argument, 
five is your second argument, and the fourth argument would be four. And so it would add 20 to your original point. The key thing, the other key thing here is it does not do a dereference. So it just adds these things together. And that's why the compiler, for whatever reason, decided to do this instead of an add instruction. So it's essentially with the one here, add EDX to EDX and move the result into EAX. Did I say EDX twice? Add EDX to EAX, move it into EAX. Which is doing what? What's going to be in EAX now? Which is 110. Are we done? Is this the end of it? Why not? We need to save it back in memory, right? Even though we've calculated that A plus B, we didn't actually complete the semantics here, right? The semantics are we have to put that value back in that location. So we have moved EAX into 804.96.34. So what's really interesting is that when I made this example, I used CentOS 6.7, and I believe on CentOS 7, I know, I know it definitely uses a new version of GCC, and so I think it does this instruction as an add instruction now. So it's just interesting to see. I don't know why. You have to dig into really why they changed that. But for whatever, whatever reason, they decided to change it. Cool. So global variables, good? Yeah? Cool. So local variables. So now when we talk about local variables, what makes a variable local as opposed to global? Scope. Scope. Right? So a local variable has a limited amount where it's going to actually be used. And we're talking specifically static scoping here. So what are the constraints on local variables in, let's say, C? It can be only accessed within that specific block, right? We know C has block level scoping, so only in between the braces is a variable declaration valid. So, where can the compiler place local variables? What choices does it have? The stack, the stack which is what? Memory, is it different from memory? Is that a super tricky question? It's just a type of memory. It's a type of memory? Is it a different location than memory? Yeah. So it is, then what? It's a different location. Then like where the global variables are stored. Yes, so it'd be somewhere different than global variables, right? So uh, one thing that, so to think about, let's talk about. So could you use global memory? We just saw global memory, right? We saw it super easy. You just assign a fixed memory offset to everything in the program, a fixed memory location to every variable. So can we just use that? Why learn something new? I mean, not learn something new. You always want to learn new things. But why do something different if the technique you already have for global variables, you know it works, you can just apply here. Security, efficiency. Recursion. Recursion? What do you mean recursion? Why is that important? I mean, recursion can generate an arbitrary amount of memory that's going to require a specific set block. So let's look at an example. So I have this factorial function. It has a parameter n. Right? Although this doesn't quite answer your question, but it's fine. I think it will. All right? So, where do, what memory location do I give this n? Is n a local variable to function factorial? Yeah, the fact that it's a parameter being passed into the function really doesn't change things that much. It still has to be local to this function, right? And it's accessible inside this function. So, how do you write a factorial function? This should be, you should be able to do this in your sleep now. Recursive functions, you have your base case, if n is equal to 0, return 1. What's my problem with my base case? Well, let's look at this. Otherwise, return factorial of n minus 1 times n. What's my problem with my base case? If you pass 
a negative number, it'll If you pass it a negative number, what happens? It will loop forever. Right? So I either need to have a very strongly worded comment on the factorial function that says, do not pass this with a negative number, which is a really bad way to enforce that because who reads comments? I should check in here, right? If I was, I would probably maybe, depending on how I was coding this, I may check, hey, if n is less than zero, uh, less than n, sorry, if n is less than zero, throw an exception, right? You should just stop. You should not be trying to calculate the factorial of a negative number. Why is that better or different than just returning one or zero? It's easier to debug. Hmm? It's easier to debug. Yeah, it's easier to debug, right? That is, the factorial function is only defined from n from zero to greater than zero, right? Actually, I don't know if that's true. Is it defined? Math people? On negative numbers? I don't think so, right? It doesn't make sense. Yeah, it's not defined, right? So if they're calling my function on input that it's not defined on, it should blow up, right? If it just gave them back zero or some random value, well, then their program's not gonna blow up, they're not gonna know they're gonna have a problem, and they're probably gonna compute some wrong result. Okay, so what would happen if I just stored n inside of a global variable? So we looked at global variables, right? So we said, eh, 
can't do global variables, right? That does not work. Fundamentally, it does not work. So what can we do instead? Well, we just talked about, right? Each invocation of that function needs its own little bit of memory, but it only needs that memory while it's executing. And then when it returns, then we can free all that memory, right? So the idea is to use scratch memory for each function. And that is where we get to the stack. So the idea is we want some little bit of place there that each function can write to. So we give each invocation of a function its own little space to write to. And then when it returns, we clean that up automatically. Cool. So what's the stack in terms of a data structure? Last in, first out, what does that mean? What operations does it support? Push and pop. So I push three things on it. One, two, three. When I pop, what's going to come up? I hear all three options there. Three. Last in, first out. So I push on one, push on two, push on three. I take something off, it's going to be three. So you can think of it uh, as we draw it, our stack will grow down. Doesn't really matter which way you think about it, but we push things on the stack, and then we pop things off. They're going to pop off in reverse order. You think we also, and this actually ties in very similarly to how we thought about lexical scoping and dynamic scoping. Each time we got to a new scope, we would add a new scope. We would push on a new scope, and then when we left that scoping, we would remove that scope and pop that scope. So you can think of the simple table that we created for dynamic scoping is using a stack, which is a different type of stack. Here we're using a stack of memory. Questions so far? Yeah, stop. Cool. Okay, so the stack is essentially scratch memory for a function. It is used in explicitly in various CPU architectures, MIPS, ARM, x86, x86-64, probably more. Even in languages that don't. So what this means is, as we'll see on x86, there are explicit push and pop instructions to push things onto the stack and to pop things off the stack. Other languages, I want to say ARM does not have that, but I can't remember. One of them, uh, you manage it yourself. So you have to manually push things on and manually pop things off. There's no explicit instruction for it. Okay, so we're going to be mainly focusing on x86 and the way it works on x86 and the way I'm going to draw it and because obviously a stack can grow in any direction for us. We're going to start at high memory addresses which are going to be on the top of the page and we will grow down to, low, to zero. So when we show memory we'll see FFFFFFF and zero at the bottom. And we'll see that our stack's going to grow down. Okay, so as a function, as scratch memory, not only can we store our local variables on there, as we'll see, but we can also push whatever variables we want onto the function, onto the stack, and pop the values off the stack. What do we have to ensure, us as a function, if we're called, the stack's at some certain position, and we push stuff onto the stack? What do we have to ensure? So we need to know we need to know the current location of the stack, and we need to be able to communicate that to other functions that we call. Okay, good. What about when we return? Could the stack just be anywhere? You remember where you started, so when you return, you return to where you started. Yes. So you got to think about it, right? Some function is calling us. We're at some arbitrary, the stack is some arbitrary location. We're going to do whatever, call whoever. When we return to that function, they don't want to have to deal with the stack being moved, right? We should be good neighbors and leave the stack exactly how we found it. Which is nice because it means we can do anything we want, but we have to make sure that that stack is consistent when we leave. Okay, so the assembly language 
in x86 explicitly supports this. So the ESP register, so what is, the, first of all, what does the E stand for here? We saw EAX, ESP. Extended, why is it extended? From 32 bits. From what? 16. 16, so that's the key thing here when you're reading these things. So if you see ESP, you know it's an x86 inch, uh, register and you know it's a 32 bit value. The old like dollar sign SP, that would be the 16 bit value. And then if, we'll, we won't look at it here, but if you ever see x86 64 code, it'll be RSP, so it'll be an R instead of an E. And I actually don't know what the R stands for. Say really extended? It's possible. Okay, so we have two operations. So we have ESP. So ESP is a pointer to the top of the stack, right? So if it's a pointer to the top of the stack, what is the value inside the ESP? The memory address of the top of the stack, exactly. So if we were to draw a box circle diagram of ES, ESP, ESP would be a box, and inside of it would be a value that would be the memory address of the top of the stack. And again, it may be, depends on how you look at things, we say top of the stack to me, where the current, if we pop things off, that's where things would come from. If we push things on, that's where they would come from. But remember, we're gonna grow the stack down. Okay, so we have two operations here that are important. We can push things on the stack, and push takes a register. So for instance, push EAX means decrement the stack pointer down specifically by four. So when we decrement, remember we have high numbers at top, low numbers at bottom, so decrement takes us down. Move down four, take the value inside EAX, copy it to that memory location. And so what would pop be? Let's say we want to now pop that value into, let's say, EBX. Do I need to move it up four first? Take the value where the stack point is currently pointing to, store it in EBX, and move up four. How can you tell that without me showing you the next bullet?